Okay, welcome to uh, chapter four, CNT 120, Network Protocols and Routing. Um, recall that in chapter one, you learned that a protocol was a set of rules that govern how data travels across a network, how data travels across uh, from our computers to cross modems and networks. And in chapter two, we also talked about uh, infrastructure and equipment, and then moving on to chapter three, where you learned how the uh, data link uh, network and transmission, transport and application layer protocols all allowed your devices to, to uh, navigate up and down the OSI model and cross your network infrastructure. Um, we looked at um, uh, the tasks associated with each layer at the OSI reference model. Look at formatting, the error detection, error correction, um, and all the tasks that are governed by the protocols. In this chapter, we want to talk about how the application data and instructions uh, make the, uh, the trip from one host to another uh, at the transport layer and the data link layers. Um, and then we're going to learn how to troubleshoot the, uh, the route issues between the hosts. Uh, so let's get moving. All right. First thing we want to look at is TCP IP. Um, TCP IP is, just, is, a, is a whole bunch of protocols. So we call it a suite of protocols. Everything from TCP, IP, UDP, um, ARPs in there. Um, and then also we want to understand that there are two main protocols that are in TCP IP. Um, and so we talk about that later on. We get more in depth in the network and we really just talk about uh, it's called IPv4 and IPv6. Right. Um, and this part of the chapter, we're going to talk about the examination of uh, the messages and the headers. Now, if we just take a look at the graphic that we have on the screen here, you can see that at the top layers, the application layer, okay, so here what you're seeing is your browser is going to talk to the web server. All right. um, at the application layer, which is layer 7, okay, it's just data. Okay, we're here, we're to, they're calling it a payload, but it's just data. Um, then we're going to move to the presentation layer. As you can see, it's, as you can see it is still just data. Yes, it's, it's, it's encrypted data. Yes, it is uh, formatted data, but it's still data. Session layer, it's, it's still data. When we get to the transport layers, when we have to start adding things to our packet, uh, the reason is because now we're going to start changing. We now we have to start identifying it. Okay. Yes, it is an ad. The browser is talking to a web server, but the packet has to be identified so that we know it's it's a web packet. Okay. We're making a request, for example. Uh, we're making a request for a, a web page. Okay, so when we're making an HTTP request, we have to put that in the header to say that this is this this is a this is a, a web packet, and therefore it must go to the web server. And we would we would identify that in the, in the transport layer header as port eighty. We would have to put a version in there saying that this is IPv4 or it's IPv6 so that we know where we're going to go with this information. Now, TCP itself, um, we like to call it that we like to call it a uh, connection oriented or best effort guaranteed delivery type of protocol. Um, as you can see by the screen in, in, here, by this graphic, that layer four we identified the the um, the packet itself. Layer three we had to say where it was going to go, what IP address is it going to go to. Layer two I had to say what MAC address is it going to go to, the data link layer, which whose network interface part am I talking to? Layer one is when we took it all down and we broke it into bits and bytes and we put it on the radio waves or we put it on pulses of light for fiber or pulses of electricity for our copper cabling. It got to our destination. The receiving node just went through the through the same process, just in reverse. 
the receiving node looked at it and said, oh, these are poles of electricity. Let me uh, in decode these pulses of electricity or pulses of light or radio waves. Let me decode them. Hey, this is a MAC address. This MAC address is, is addressed to me. Uh, and then it looks deeper to the MAC address and says, hey, there's an IP address in here. Uh, what's this IP address? Oh, this IP address is addressed to me. I can look at this. And then it says, okay, what am I looking at? Web. Awesome. Okay. Do I have all the packets? Oh, I do have all the packets. Let's go ahead and close this session off. Stop communicating with the other node and let's send it up to the presentation layer where it can decrypt it and decompress this packet and send it to the browser you know, all of that is really what happened when we're uh, when we're sending our, our data out um, as I mentioned just a moment ago TCP is connection oriented which means that we're guaranteeing that the data is going to get from point A to point B. We are going to have a conversation. It's called a three-way handshake. Now, this three-way handshake uh, enables us to say, hey, you and I are going to have a conversation here. And we have to come up with a layer of communication. Real simply put, I'm going to talk this fast because that's all the faster you can interpret my speech or I'm going to talk super fast because you can you can handle me talking super fast if we think about the old days when we used to dial our our computers out and we had that de -de 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 sound going back and forth those tones going back and forth those were actually the two modems dial out modems or dial in modems on each end of the communication synchronizing a speed in which they can communicate so that they can send data because they had to be on the same page it's no different than if I have a network card that has the ability to speak 100 meg per second but the server I'm talking to can speak gig the server is going to have to tone it down a notch so that it speaks the same speed that I can speak. That's part of the connection orientation. That's the synchronization piece of a three-way handshake. Then on the other end, that guy is going to say, hey, I want to acknowledge the fact that we're going to have this conversation and we're going to speak at this speed. So there's really two conversations going on in our three-way handshake. It's a conversation from computer A to B and a conversation from computer P, computer B to computer A going back and forth. And then what we're going to do is we're going to actually put numbers on each and every one of our piece of our conversation. We're going to put numbers on there and the sequence so that everything can be put back in order because sometimes my data is going to get to its destination out of order. So TCP needs to have the ability to put it all back together when we get to that part. And then the acknowledgement piece is the exact same way. So if we were to take a look at this three-way handshake, you'll see that computer A is having a conversation with computer B. And when it starts and it takes this number right here, Okay, and it's going to talk 937-013558. And then when B responds back, it's going to increment it from 558 to 559. It's going to increment it by one. But what's crazy is it's now, it just started the conversation. So it starts a conversation at 304-395-8669. So my response was up by one, but I'm starting a conversation back to you, which begins with 304. And then you're going to respond back to me, Mr. Computer A, to this conversation here. So here's my conversation, right? And then I'm going to respond back to you. I'm going to increment by one also. And that's TCP. Connection oriented, reliable, great stuff. User datagram protocol, on the other hand, your VoIP conversations, your um, video conversations. 
we've all experienced the lag in networking before. It's not something we enjoy. But we've all dealt with it. When you're watching a YouTube video, when you've got that spinning circle just rotating on your screen and you want to climb through your screen to make it stop, but you can't do that. It's literally impossible. <clears throat> So with UDP, it's what we call unreliable. There's no three-way handshake. I'm just throwing my data at you. So think of it as this way, okay? You and I are sitting across the room and you say, hey, throw me the remote control. I want to change the TV station. So I pick up the remote control and I throw it to you. I didn't guarantee that you were going to catch it. I didn't guarantee to you that I was even going to hit my mark. But I threw it to you. Because that's what you asked me to do. That's UDP. Now, the whole thing about UDP, because if we were to look back here, you can see there's a heck of a lot going on in the TCP segment. You can see that each one of these lines is 32 bits long. Where, where it's coming from, where it's going to. The sequence number, the knowledge number, it's all part of that conversation. How big everything is going to be, okay? Is it is it an urgent flag or not? Okay, is this an acknowledgement or not? Uh, do I need to reset my conversation? Uh, is it a synchronization bit? When do I close things down? How much data can you handle at this time, my sliding window size? Okay, uh, and then here, uh, at the start of my packet, at the end of my packet, okay, I have a number, okay? Everything when you get to it has to equal this much. So we're gonna check how big it is, okay? I gave you a number at the start. When you get it all in there, you're gonna add it all up and check to make sure that the numbers match. If they don't match, it's a bad packet, request a new one. I okay, think of a checksum as, as uh, we gave you a number, add everything up, the the answer to an addition problem is the sum. We're going to check to make sure the sum equals the number we gave you in the beginning. Check sum. Okay. Padding. Okay. So this piece here. Okay. If this one here doesn't make 32 um, bytes of information, then I got to just add some extra padding to it. So it has to reach 32. And then after all this is my data. Not a whole lot there in the, in the, in the end. Not a whole lot of data. Now, in UDP, we're not doing any error checking. We're not checking for sequencing. We're not looking for, for flow control. Okay. All that being said, you would think that it, things, it could be faulty. Things, things, would, uh, things would break more often, but they really don't. It's called an unreliable protocol, but it actually is relatively reliable. It's still reliable, in fact, that that we will actually uh, do voice over IP with it. We will do video over IP with it. We will make sure, you know, we, we, we trust it enough, I should say, that we will have these conversations over the internet, voice for our phones and video conversations, video conferencing. Uh, streaming this video over the internet using UDP with the utmost faith that we know it's going to work just fine. The UDP header contains only four fields, source, destination, length, and checksum. And the data. All that being said, you can definitely understand why if we were to put these two uh, these two graphics side by side, you can see why UDP is just so much faster. There's so much less overhead happening uh, during our conversation. The one, one of the components of the TCP IP protocol suite is IP. So if we look at TCP slash IP, TCP IP, TCP is my connection-oriented piece. IP is connection-less oriented. It operates at the network layer of the OSI model. 
it specifies where we got to send our data. It specifies where it's coming from. It does not establish a session to send its IP packets. Each IP packet travels separately from all other IP, pa IP packets. It doesn't matter what destination or what path it takes to get to its destination. Once IP is delivered to the host, it's up to TCP, it's up to, TCP to put it all back in, in the correct order. It also relies on either TCP or UDP to ensure that each message reaches the correct application. As we already know, there's two versions of IP that are used in networks today, IP version 4 and IP version 6. IPv4 came out in 1981. In 1981, we didn't think the internet was going to be as huge and successful as it was. We soon knew that we would grow, we would outgrow IP version 4, but here we are in uh, 2020. Uh, and we're still using IP version 4, but IP version 6 has been around for a while. We ran out of IP version 4 addresses. We've had to, we've had to create uh, different methods of, of surviving with IPv4. We went to, we now use private IPv4 addresses uh, on our internal networks and we use public IP addresses on the outside to communicate so we can get out to the internet. In order for our private addresses to be able to communicate on the internet, we have to translate them using a, uh, a protocol called NAT, Network Address Translation, to be able to communicate. It's not efficient. We have another protocol out there called IP version 6. IP version 6 came out in 1998. We're not going to ever run out of IP version 6 addresses. There are 30, 340 undecillion addresses, I believe. That's 340 with an additional 36 zeros following it. It is said that they believe there are more IP version 6 addresses out there available and there are grains of sand on all the beaches in the world. That's a lot. I don't know who had the, who had the job of counting all those, but that's a lot. Now, so as a network technician, you're going to need to be able to understand and be able to troubleshoot both IPv4 and IPv6 packets. And an IPv4 packet looks like this. Okay, what version is it? Is it IPv4 or IPv6? We're going to have to have an internet header length as well in here. The internet header length will indicate the uh, length of the IPv header in bytes. The differential services informs the routers of the level of precedence that they should apply when processing the incoming packet. The total length kind of just makes sense right there, right? identifies the total length of the IP packet, including the header and data in bytes. It cannot exceed 65,535 or two to the 16th. The identification field identifies the uh, message to which the uh, packet belongs, enables the receiving host to reassemble uh, fragmented messages. We have our flags indicates whether a message was fragmented and if it is fragmented whether the packet is the last fragment or the first bit the offset identifies where the packet fragment belongs in a series of of um, incoming fragments the TTL time to live how long should this packet survive on the network before we if we drop it? We just can't have a packet bouncing around and never finding its destination. If it doesn't find its destination in a certain amount of time, we gotta we gotta kill the packet. We gotta drop it. Protocol identifies the type of protocol that um, will receive the packet. So, for example, is it TCP? Is it UDP? Is it ICMP? The header checksum allows the receiving host to calculate whether the IP header has been corrupted during transmission. So if, it, if the checksum accompanying the message does not match the calculated checksum, 
when the packet is received, the packet is then presumed to be corrupt and be discarded. And if it's a TCP packet, we'll ask for another one. If it's UDP, too bad, so sad. Obviously, we have to have a to know where it's going, where it came from. Is there additional routing information and timing information that would be an option? Padding, and then of course our data. Then there's say then there's IP version six. IP version six is uh, 128 bit hexadecimal addressing. Slightly similar uh, when we look if we were to look at it um, at a, an IPv6 packet, it would look slightly slightly similar in that yes, we would have a version field. Uh, we would have a pay length, we would have source address, we would have uh, the next header, hop limits, okay, similar to a, a TTL. The traffic class identifies the, uh, the priority. Flow label indicates uh, which flow or sequence of packets from one source to multiple destinations where the packet belongs. Routers interpret the flow information to ensure that packets belonging to the same transmission will arrive together. The payload length indicates the size of the payload or the data carried by the packet. The next header indicate, identifies the type of header that immediately follows the IP packet header. It's usually gonna be TCP or UDP. Hop limit indicates the uh, number of times the packet can be forwarded by routers on the network. Very similar to a TTL. How long is it, will, this, will this packet survive? Source and destination, in my opinion, are pretty much, uh, uh, this makes sense, logical sense. You'll notice that the source and destination are so much larger, okay? Because if we take a look, it's 32 bits wide, right? But then it's 32, 32, 32, 32. Four times 32 is, anyone, anyone? 128. So it's 128-bit hexadecimal address. right? Here. When we say hexadecimal, it's 38, it's 128 bits, but it would be too difficult to read if we're 128 bits long. So we represent it out as... Uh, eight blocks of hexadecimal. So next we want to talk about is ICMP, the Internet uh, Control Message Protocol. These are simply put, the ICMP packet is it's that response we get back. It gives us the ability to detect error messages, but we can't fix error messages, okay? Uh, when you ping, for example, it, it, it's, it's like your best friend when it comes to troubleshooting. So if I want to do a trace route uh, to Microsoft.com because I, I can't, communicate with it today. Then what it does is it sends out ICMP packets to each stop from point A to point B and then responds back if we were able to communicate with those particular nodes or hosts on the way from here to Microsoft. Same thing if I were to say ping 192.1.1.1. I want to ping my router. Okay, I would get a response back that it was successful. It announces transmission failures and successes. It detects errors but does not correct the error. As technicians, this is one of our most uh, critical troubleshooting tools that we have in our arsenal. IPv6 and IPv4 both perform ICMP functions. Okay. 
Okay. Next thing I want to talk about with you is art. Now, I I don't want to go so deep into art that it gets confusing. What's important to understand when we talk about ARP is that in order for me to communicate with another node on another network, or I should say on my network, I need to know not only your IP address, but I need to know your MAC address. You see, if I need to, if I need to communicate from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to say Australia, I don't need to know the MAC address of the node in Australia. I need to know the MAC address of the node that I'm going to talk to that's going to allow me to communicate to Australia. So, for example, if I want to leave my network, I must use my default gateway. So, therefore, I must know the, I, the MAC address of my default gateway. Then my default gateway will then forward me over to Australia. I need to know, for example, the MAC address of the printer on my network if I want to communicate to it so I can print. I need to know the IP address and the MAC address. There are way too many instances where I know the IP address of a device but I don't know the MAC address of the device. I have to then learn the MAC address of that device. And that is what we call an ARP request. So what I would do then, or what my computer would do, because it does it without me knowing it, what would have to happen is my device, my computer would say, hey, I know your I know your IP address. Could you do me a favor and send me your MAC address? And this would go out to every node on my LAN. And in return, the the receiving node would say, "Hey, that was my IP address." Here's my MAC address. So going out will be a broadcast address, which stops all traffic on my network so I can broadcast. So they're not what you want to have happen on your network quite often. So what we do is we keep a table called an ARP table of all the addresses we know about so that we can just refer to that first rather than saying every time I want to communicate, I got to send a broadcast out. You know, that'd be like screaming um, on a PA system in a building. Okay, let's say you've got, you know, 100 offices in your building and you need to call whoever's in room 103 and you get on the PA system and say, hey, uh, room 103, can you call me? You know, it'd be a very inefficient way of communicating. So that's kind of what we do with, with an ARP table or to create an ARP table. It was like, hey, room 103, call back, tell me what your number is so I can have them both. I'll create a list, a phone list. So that I, I, can, I don't have to keep waking up everyone in the entire network of what's going on. How do I get my ARP table? Well, I go into the command prompt in Microsoft Windows, for example, and I type ARP space dash A, and it will give me a complete list of all the addresses that I've learned about. You'll also see some addresses in there that have been statically assigned. Okay, so as you can see, like my multicast addressing, Okay, that I'm going to use, those are all static. Those were created for me by the operating system. Or manually put in somehow. Okay. Then there's this little thing we call Ethernet. Now, Ethernet, in many cases, it's like a, I want to call it a misnomer. Because if I were to ask you to go get me an Ethernet cable, you're going to run over and get me a patch cable. You're going to get me a straight through patch cable which today we call those Ethernets. Okay. But the standard Ethernet was created by uh, Digital Equipment Corporation and Xerox and Intel. And it created this standard 
of Ethernet before the IEEE came out and standardized Ethernet itself. So unlike higher layer protocol, pro, protocols, Ethernet adds both a header and a trailer to its payload. Uh, it inherits these, these header and trailers from the layers above them, and it creates a frame around the payload. Um, so it kind of looks like this, but most of your like your packet snippers like Wireshark won't even see or be able to capture these the first two fields, um, and sometimes won't even capture the frame check sequence there at the end. Um, as the data is removed and uh, from the incoming transmissions by the hardware before it even becomes visible to any uh, but the most sophisticated of, uh, of, of uh, capture tools today. Um, we could sit here and go talk about this all day, but the preamble synchron that gets our synchronization moving uh, from the receiver's clock. Uh, we have our start frame delimiter, which is our SFD, indicates the frame is about to begin. Then in the header, we're going to have our destination, our source, and the type field are gonna go in there. Um, then we're gonna have our data, obviously, <clears throat> plus any padding that we need to to get to our 1500 bytes. And then the frame check sequence will ensure that the data at the destination uh, matches the data that was issued from the source. And it'll use something called a CRC or a uh, uh, cyclical redundancy uh, check. We've also got something in here called an MTU or a maximum transmission unit. The typical maximum transmission unit is going to be uh, uh, 1500 bytes of, of uh, value. Uh, which is pretty much the, the internet standard. Um, however, other layer two technologies might allow a higher MTU or maybe even a lower MTU, but the standard is gonna be 1500 bytes. Um, because of the overhead present in each frame and the time it takes for the next uh, to manage the frame, the use of a larger frame size on a network generally results in faster throughput. Uh, there's a couple of notable exceptions to ethernet frame size limitation. One, ethernet frames on a VLAN uh, or virtual LAN can have an extra four byte field between the uh, the source address and the type field, which would then be used to manage the VLAN. Okay. Uh, if this field exists, the maximum frame size is uh, 1522. Uh, we'll talk about VLANs um, in the CMT125 class. Um, some special purpose uh, networks use a proprietary version of Ethernet, which allows for what we call a jumbo frame, uh, in which the MTU can be a, as high as uh, 9,198 bytes, depending on the type of Ethernet uh, architecture being used. Um, next thing I want to discuss with you will be routers. Now, at this point, uh, we've talked about switches, and what switches do is switches connect segments of a network, whereas routers connect different networks. You as the user, your nodes communicating over the network are using the protocols TCP IP that we just talked about. We call these routed protocols. Now, they're routed protocols, so they allow your different nodes to communicate with different nodes on your LAN. But there are times, in, in which case in today's society, where we need to communicate with nodes that are, not, that are not on our networks. So we'll have to communicate to a router, because routers allow us to go from network to network. So, for example, in your home configurations, You've got your Comcast router, you've got your Verizon router, you've whoever your ISP is, you have their router. And that router allows your network on your home. So if you take your router and you divide it into two, okay, one half of your router is connected to your home network. The other half of that router connects to your ISP's network, which literally gives you two separate networks. The router's job is to allow you to communicate from one network to the other network, pass those packets through from network to network, which enables your packets to be routable, to be able to cross from one network to another over the router. 
Now the router needs to be able to communicate with other routers so we know where to send the data. Now these, these routers use a protocol called routing protocols and they allow us to connect to similar networks. They interpret layer three and even layer four addressing so they can say, hey, web traffic, got it. FTP traffic, got it. I know what to do with it. They also enable you to determine, like for example, if I need to, to send data to Australia, they enable me to choose different highways to get there, different paths to get there. There's multiple paths to get from point A to point B, which is the fast, which has the least congestion, which has um, the most efficient pathway to get there. And during your transmission, it might actually change from point A to point B. It gives you the ability to reroute that traffic. If, say, during the middle of our conversation, the uh, we found a better route. Different types of routers. Your ISP might use that monster there on the left. And then in your businesses, you might have one of these modular routers here in the middle. And then probably in your house, you've got that little tiny home router, perhaps. Routers can also give us the ability to filter broadcast transmissions. Because here's the beauty. When you did that ARP, it was a broadcast. Broadcasts on a network are what we call undesirable. We do not want to be sending out that ARP transmission to everybody on our, on our network, let alone the entire internet. Routers don't broadcast. Now, routers do technically broadcast. They have their own type of broadcast. When they broadcast, which means they are literally speaking to their neighboring routers, depending on their protocol. Sometimes they'll talk to everybody in their autonomous system. But they're only talking to routers, not nodes. They're not stopping transmission from occurring, per se. Routers have the ability to be our first line of defense as well. For example, let's say I, I wanted to uh, block all Telnet traffic on my network, which is Telnet's not secure. So I want to block it. I can I can write what's called an access control list to stop all all uh, all Telnet traffic coming in or out of my network. Uh, if you do a look up on YouTube, you'll see that I that I just posted uh, two videos for access control lists. Okay. Um, they support simultaneous local and remote connectivity. They can provide high network fault tolerance. They can run SNMP and monitor network traffic. We can use, we can use them to diagnose uh, uh, problems and set alarms using SNMP, reporting back to a management information base. We have different types of routers. We have our core routers, which are the routers that we run inside of our autonomous system. So for those who don't know, an autonomous system is a network system under one governance. Okay, one administrator is running that autonomous system. Routers that are on the edge. So for example, your house is your own autonomous system and your router that attaches to your ISP okay, that attaches your ISP is your edge router. So yes, your core router can be your edge router at the same time. The exterior routers, okay, those are the ISP's routers. There is only one protocol that runs on the internet. It's BGP. It is your only exterior gateway routing protocol that we have. We can also connect networks today uh, layer three wise, okay? Because switches are layer two by default. But we can create small networks within our LAN and we can use layer three switches to communicate those different networks inside of our building to talk to each other without using a router but they are not capable of being used as a router to go out to the World Wide Web. 
firewalls can, but not, not the switches. A layer four switch is, these are typically appliances that allow us to filter using access control list. It's, at this point, these are, this section is really over and above the, um, uh, this curriculum where we are right now uh, for what you need as an intro to networking. Uh, talking about a layer four switch uh, as anything more than an application switch that allows you to filter. Uh, enable the switch perform um, packet filtering and it looks at the packet uh, looks at the uh, at the header field at the on the transport layer and says oh this is FTP not doing FTP oh this is telnet we're not doing telnet um, these layer four switches are what we call core switches Okay, you might buy a regular standard uh, layer two switch for like 300 and some dollars, where you might drop 50 grand on a high end layer four Cisco switch. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, routers broadcast to other routers. Routers need to be able to communicate with other routers. Routers need to know who they're connected to and who their neighbor's connected to because there's a lot of routers in between Harrisburg and Australia. And the routers need to be able to communicate with each other so they know what the best path to Australia is. So what they do is they keep a database that has all the information about all the nodes and all the networks and they keep them in a routing table. So I might know about, if I'm a router, I might know about the six routers that I'm connected to. And then those routers know about six additional routers they're connected to, and so on and so on. They pass this information back and forth so that we can make a determination on what is the best way for me to get my data from point A to point B. Every time I go from router to router to router to router, it's called a hop. Some routing protocols will re rely specifically on how many hops it takes for me to get from point A to point B. Some will go hops and connection speeds. Some will go hops, connection speeds, and traffic, connect uh, congestion, delay, okay? These are things we call metrics that are listed in there. So in this case here, router A knows about the information in its network on switch A. It also knows about uh, the network on C, on switch C, D, okay? And it knows about router B, okay? And the network on switch B. And these three routers are always going to be in communication with each other. And router A and LAN A will also know that the only way that they can go to the internet is through router B. Now, how it gets to router B might change. For example, if the connection between router A and router B goes down, router A will know, will learn that it has to go to C to get to B to get to the internet. And that is all learned dynamically based on the routing protocols. Or, if need be, we can just input the information in manually. The problem in that case here, in this scenario here, if I did a static route to say the only way to get to the internet is through B from router A, and that connection goes down, router uh, LAN A would lose connectivity to the internet if I statically assigned it. So the only time you want to statically assign a network, okay, maybe B. Because everybody has to go through B, okay? The only static static route that I can see would be viable here would be to say that in order to go to the internet, 
on router B, you use this interface here. But this would not be a static route. This would, these would have to be learned. Because, for example, C would use B to get to the internet. But if this connection were to become severed, C would have to go to A, then to B to get out. So I would not statically assign that. The only static assignment would be from B to the internet. If I manually put the information in, it's called a static route. If I learn about my paths, the best way to get from point A to point B, through routing updates, those are called dynamic routes. How do we find out these commands? Well, if I am on a Windows system or a Linux system, Okay, if I'm on a host, I would use the command route in Linux. If I'm in Windows, I would use the route print command. And the command you're going to use a lot in this net in these networking classes would be show IP route because we use Cisco routers in our lab settings. As I mentioned earlier, we have this little thing called routing metrics. Now metrics um, are things that we would look at, that a router would look at to determine what's the best way for me to get from point A to point B. As I mentioned earlier, one of them was hop count. What's the speed of my line? What's the actual, the through, what's the theoretical bandwidth and the actual throughput? Remember earlier we talked about bandwidth and throughput as actually being two different terms. Now, if we listen to the commercial world, they, you know, everybody talks about bandwidth and throughput as being the same thing, but they technically are not. Throughput is measured as bits per second and bandwidth is measured in megahertz. Is there any delay, is there any latency on my line? How much traffic is on my line? What are the MTUs that this, this device allows versus another device? We talked about that earlier. How reliable is this line? How many hops am I going to have? That whole topology of the network is all going to come into play here. We learn about this using routing protocols. We have different types of routing protocols. Some routing protocols use something called an administrative distance. And the lower the administrative distance, the more reliable okay, my, uh, my network is. So, for example, um, in, a, in the previous slide where we had a connection from A to B, we're directly connected. The administrative distance there is zero. Now, for me to for, for me to go from A to C to B, and I had to learn that network through, say, uh, OSPF, my administrative distance became 110. So at the higher administrative distance, it's less reliable. The time it takes for my network to learn about a uh, about what the best path is or what my paths are is my convergence time and then everything the mtus and the protocols all that going on we've been talking about the entire day that's our overhead and all that comes into play now we talked about tcp ip we talked about udp and those were programs protocols that are routed protocols that can travel across a router, but the protocols that allow our routers to communicate with each other are routing protocols. These are the most common. You'll see the first five of these are interior gateway protocols. These are the ones inside all of our autonomous systems. Now, the biggest thing I want you to take away from this are the distance vectors. Now, a distance vector protocol pretty much just uses hop count. So these two RIP versions have a maximum hop count of 15. If you have more than 15 hops in your network, you're not going to use these. Then we have our OSPF, IS, IS, and EIGRP. There are also interior gateway protocols, but they're link state. So if we were to go back to the previous slide, um, when the connection from A to B went down, okay, what would happen would be 
as soon as A and B recognized that the link was down, they would communicate to their neighboring uh, routers and say, hey, just want you to know. We just lost connection from A to B. Recreate your network map to reflect that A and B is down. And we must find a new way to get out to the internet. Then when the connection from A to B went back up, we would then we would then notice that the state of the link has come back alive and we would notify our neighboring routers again, telling everybody, hey, the connection from A to B to the internet is back up. Please update your maps accordingly. The last one is the BGP. This is what is used uh, out in the core. This is what your ISPs are using. That is EGP. Currently, right now, uh, EGP is the default gateway of the internet. It is used by the edge routers and exterior routers to distribute data outside of the autonomous system and is currently the only BGP or the EGP in use today. So in here, I can use RIP, I can use OSPF, ISIS, or EIGRP, which is EIGRP is a Cisco proprietary protocol, but they have created a version to work with other devices other than Cisco. The OSPF, Open Shortest Path, path First, Interior Gateway Protocol supports very large networks. There is no hop limits like 15 per. It uses Dijkstra's algorithms for determining best paths, shares its information with its neighboring routers, and they share with theirs, everybody in their area. Low overhead, fast conversion times, However, when changes do occur, it does use up a lot of memory and CPU power for the calculations. It is considered to be stable and prevents routing loops. Routing loop would bring down your network in a heartbeat. ISIS, similar to, o to OSPF, designed to be used on core routers only. It is not handcuffed to IPv4. It easily adapts to IP version 6. EIGRP, an advanced distance vector protocol that combines some of the features of, of the link state protocol, is also called a distance vector protocol. That's why it's called a hybrid. Originally proprietary to Cisco routers, but they do have another component that they've written in so that it's like HPs or somebody else can use. BGP is the only current EGP. It is considered to be the protocol of the internet. It can spend multiple autonomous systems. Determines the best path based on many different factors. It can be configured to follow policies that might avoid a certain router or instruct a group of routers to prefer a particular route. And it is the most complex of routing protocols, which is way beyond the scope of this course. Troubleshooting is where we always finish up. This is where we make our bread and butter. TCP IP itself comes with a plethora of uh, utilities that we can use. And when we say utilities, I don't mean it's got a bunch of little programs that we can run on our computer to figure out what's wrong. There are those, yes. But more importantly, things that you can use just at the command prompt to make your life a lot easier. One, netstat. If you run netstat in the Windows command prompt, you're going to find out all, all about the different uh, connections that your device has. Okay, which connections are currently established for your for your computer? How many messages have been handled by a network interface since it was it's currently act turned it on? How many errors have been running on that? Okay. You just do plain netstat; it'll tell you everything about the active connections. Okay, if you do, you put these arguments or command options after them, you can list the connections, including the IP addresses and the ports. Very helpful. 
Uh, I've used this one already when I'm trying to determine what's going on with a particular node. The dash F that will include IP addresses, ports, and the DNS connections, okay. and so on and so on. These are all in your book as well, and you can always refer back. Uh, I typically just do it. Um, my most common ones that I use are A, N, and just plain old that stat. Okay. Trace R T and trace R T and trace route. This is something that I spoke about earlier in today's lesson. Uh, trace route. If if I want to know all the different uh, nodes or hops or find out where a break is between point A and point B, uh, I can run one of these commands. The trace RT is for Windows, and trace route is for our Linux boxes. Uh, basically, what's happening is when we run one of these commands, the the node will automatically uh, make a a, a determination or of which um, or how many how many hops we're going to have between point A and point B, then it will individually ping each one of those routers on its way, typically usually stopping at 30 hops until it gets to its destination. Uh, sometimes a trace route or a trace test might uh, stop before it gets to its destination. Uh, it could be um, maybe one of the nodes that you're um, that we're trying to reach is down. Uh, maybe it's too busy to process lower, lower met, low, lower UDP or ICMP messages, or perhaps um, you know a node might um, might have blocked ICMP messages. A lot of companies will do that. Um, they don't want, uh, for example, uh, a company giving them what's called a denial of service attack, where you know. We start hammering a, um, a network interface card with uh, ICMP packets that they are then that they are then required or forced to respond to, in which case would interrupt traffic. That is against the law, by the way. Path ping, not a huge fan of this one myself. It the utility that combines uh, both ping and trace route give us a little bit more information about. Uh, about our communication. So basically I'm pinging and I'm doing a trace route. Uh, I seldom use it. Um, I'm more of a ping, ping guy myself. Uh, TCP dump is a free command line utility or a packet sniffer. It runs on Linux and other uh, Unix operating systems. Okay. Um, other commands that we might use, ARP, uh, we've talked about already, DIG is for looking up DNS. I actually used NSLOOKUP just the other day because I needed some information. Um, NSLOOKUP is a uh, it's an IPv4 uh, command line utility. I was creating a lab, um, and I run IPv6 on my networks. Um, so when I did a, uh, I wanted to ping uh, hack.edu to find out the IP address, and it pinged it. Uh, via IPv6, but I wanted the IPv4, so I use the NS lookup to get my information. Okay. One of the problems that you might run into will be duplicate MAC addresses. Now, this is rare. Okay, each individual network interface card is supposed to have its own 48 bit hexadecimal unique address. Now, in the event that there is a mistake and you actually have one that was the same, okay. I've heard it happen, have yet to witness it ever myself. Um, but there's also a thing, something called spoofing. So that if a node knows your MAC address, finds out what your MAC address is, and what we call clones it, then they could actually intercept data meant for you, which would be called a man in the middle attack. Okay. Uh, hardware failure, so when a router or switch or a NIC or hardware goes down, okay, uh, you can use trace, trace RT or trace route to track down uh, functioning routers, okay, try pinging, okay, um, you can use uh, Cisco's network discovery protocol to find out who your neighboring routers are, there are other network discovery protocols that we can use, okay, um, 
that pretty much does it. What we talked about today was that TCP suite of protocols, uh, two main protocols, IPv4 and IPv6. Some of the protocols that we use inside of the suite, UDP and ARP. Right, TCP operates the transport layer. It's reliable, connection-oriented, guaranteed delivery. UDP, connection-less-oriented, unreliable. IP, uh, it's connection-less-oriented as well. Works in conjunction with TCP uh, to guarantee your delivery. ICMP is a network layer protocol that reports back. This is your messages you receive. Uh, ARP, uh, although we, we spend a lot of time on it, works in conjunction with IPv4 because you need to have MAC addressing and IP addressing to communicate. We said that the, the uh, routers join uh, different networks and switches join segments of a network. Layer three switches work like routers but cannot connect you to the internet. Routers have uh, routing tables. Routing tables are created by routing protocols which can be static or dynamic. Uh, the route command allows you to view the router's tables. And the routers use things like hop counts and delay and congestion and theoretical and true bandwidth and load to determine what the, uh, what the best path is. Okay. We talked about different types of interior gateway protocols and exterior. And we talked about different utilities like ping. Uh, I did not mention IP config and IF config because we have been using those throughout our semester. But if you need to know, if you don't remember, how to command prompt, if you want to know what your IP address is, you'll do an IP config command. And if you want to know uh, on a Linux box, it's IF config. To find out some DNS information, you can use NS lookup for Windows or dig on uh, a Linux box. Okay. All right. Now, there is one more thing I would like to add to the end of this lesson for you. So we can see a practical example of the TCP communication and we just got done talking about it. It was a lot of theory. Um, so I'm gonna give you a, a router simulation uh, on a packet tracer that I've actually assigned to this lesson. So in this example here, I'm gonna just show you how I do things. One, I logged into, uh, I opened up my packet tracer, logged into Cisco um, using the information that I gave you in a previous video. Under user profile, I'm gonna change it. So my name is in there, choose okay, choose yes. So it just resets the application. It just prevents um, anybody else from, from um, working on this on this job uh, or sharing of, of the data and uh, of uh, and sure I'm really just adding to the integrity of the, of the lesson um, so here we are to simply as simple as um, we've got a web client and a web server uh, so a web client and a web server obviously would just be asking for a website um, so a little background here. Oh, first off, we're just going to examine the HTTP web traffic, and we're going to display the elements of the TCP protocol suite. And the example also gives you a um, a lesson on how to use uh, Packet Tracer to actually see activity and the protocols that are going through. Since we don't have the ability in this lab to do Wireshark, because I'm not, we can't assume that everybody has Wireshark at home. So a little background, uh, the simulation activity is intended to provide a foundation for understanding the TCP IP protocol suite and the relationship that it has to the OSI model. Uh, we're going to use simulation mode, which will allow you to view the data contents being sent across the network at each layer. And as data moves through the network, it'll be broken down into smaller pieces and identified so that the pieces can be put back together when they arrive at their destination. Each piece is then assigned to a specific name, uh, PDU, protocol data unit, and then associated with a specific layer of the TCP, IP, and OSI models. The packet tracer simulation mode enables you to view each of the layers and the associated PDU. And what we're going to do is the following steps will lead the user through the process of requesting a web page from a web server by using the web browser application available on a PC client.
Now, even though much of the information displayed is um, will be discussed uh, later on uh, through our labs in more detail, this is a nice opportunity for you to explore the functionality of Packet Tracer and be able to visualize the whole encapsulation process that we want to talk about here. So part one here is we want to examine the HTTP web traffic. And as you can see, we've got a web client and a web server. Um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to switch from real-time mode to simulation mode. So if we look over here, by default in the right-hand side, we have, uh, by default, uh, Packet Tracer is always set up in real-time mode, which makes things just work a lot faster. And then we have simulation mode. So in the lower right corner of the Packet Tracer interface are the buttons at the top between real-time and simulation. Um, if we're in real time, it operates with more realistic timing. So however, a powerful feature that we have allows the user to stop time by switching to simulation mode. So in simulation mode, the packets are delivered as animated envelopes. Uh, time is event driven and the user can then step through the networking event so you can actually make everything happen accordingly. So go ahead and click simulation mode uh, to switch from real time mode to simulation mode. Okay, so this little window here will pop up. We want to select HTTP from our events list. So um, we want to click the Edit Filter button at the bottom of the simulation mode right here to display the available uh, visible events. Toggle the Show All None. And you'll see we're going to choose which ones we want. Um, and notice the checkbox is switched from unchecked to checked. So toggle that. Okay, so now everybody is checked. Okay. We do it again and it will be cleared. Okay. And we only want to select our HTTP traffic. There. Okay. Yeah, to hit the miscellaneous button there. Sorry. All right. So we put it. We put a checkbox. Okay. And then we want to click the upper right hand, the X in the upper right corner of the window to close the edit filters window, and the visible event should now only display HTTP traffic. Next, what we want to do is we want to generate some HTTP web traffic. So currently, the, this panel over here on the right-hand side is empty. There are five columns listed across the top of the event list within the simulation panel. Uh, the web server and web client are displayed in the left-hand pane. The panels can be adjusted in size by hovering next to the scroll bar and dragging them left to right. When you see the double-headed arrow, so we can drag it like that if we want to. Uh, we want to click the web client in the far left pane right here. And this window here will come up. We want to click the desktop tab. And then if we scroll over to the right here, we can see that we have a web browser. So we're going to go ahead and click the web browser to open it. In the URL address bar up top, we're going to type www osi.local and we're going to go ahead and click go okay so now you'll notice over here where we, we it, it you probably didn't see it but it said captured two and it that that turned on okay now because the um time of simulation mode is event driven you must use the capture forward button And you want to press that four times. Now we have four events that are listed. 
if we look at the web client's web browser page, so if we come back to here, we will see that we have connected to the web server. We have successfully accessed the home page for the web server. Okay. Next, we want to click on the first uh, colored square box under the events list in the type column. That would be this guy right here. It may be necessary to expand the simulation panel or use the scroll bar directly. And you'll see we have it right here. Okay, this opened up. The PDU information uh, at device for the web client window will be displayed. Okay, in this window, there are only two tabs, OSI and outbound PDU, OSI model and outbound PDU details. Because this is the start of the transmission, let me fix that. There we go. All right. That was close. Now, because this is the start of the transmission, as more events are examined, there will be three tabs displayed, adding a tab for inbound PDU, because remember, we're sending and then we have to receive. When an event in the, is the last event in the stream of traffic, only the OSI model and inbound PDU detail, detail tabs would then be displayed. So if we want to ensure that the OSI model, model tab is open, and under the outbound layers column, you want to click layer seven. So. So we have our app on layer seven. And it says that the HTTP client sent an H sent a request to the server. Okay. At layer four, it said that the send segment information, the sequence number one, acknowledge number one, and the data length was 102. And you see that the source port was 1025, and the destination port was port 80, because we're talking to the web server on port 80. We're trying to communicate with him on web. Okay. The destination port was 80 for layer four. And the destination IP address, okay, was 192.168.1.254. This is the address of the web server that we're trying to communicate with. At layer two, we're using the default now, which is Ethernet 2 header, uh, inbound and outbound MAC addresses, because we know ours and we have to know theirs in order to communicate, which we just talked about in the previous lesson. Now you want to click the outbound PDU details. Okay. And this is what we were looking at earlier in our lesson. Information listed in the PDU format is reflected at the layers in the, of, the, of, of, the, um, of the TCP model, which are the four layers of TCP. The information listed under the Ethernet 2 section of the outbound PDU details tab provides even more detailed information than is listed under the layer two of the OSI. And the outbound PDU details provides more descriptive and detailed information. The values under the destination MAC and source within Ethernet 2 section of the PDU details appear on the OSI model tab under layer two, but are not identified as such. Okay. So if we were to say, what is the common information listed under the IP section of PDU details? as compared to information under the OSI tab, we would notice in that case here, if we were to back back and forth, okay, that the source uh, port and destination port at layer four, okay, now we'll come back over here to our layer four, we will see that our source port and our destination port would be the same. here and here, 80 and 1,025. And then if we come over here, 80 and 1,025. If we go to the next layer, okay, because that was just in our first one, 
when we move on to the next colored square box under the event list type column, only layer one is active. Okay, it's the only one that's not grayed out. The device is moving the frame from the buffer and placing it onto the network. Uh, if we go to the next HTTP type box within the event list, like so, um, the window contains uh, both in layers and out layers. So if we like a look up top, we have our inbound and now we have our outbound. Notice the direction of the arrow directly under the in layers. Mm -hmm. Trying to get everybody balanced out here and make it more balanced here. There we go. Okay, so now so notice the direction of the arrow directly under the in layers column. It's pointing upward, indicating the direction the data is traveling. If we scroll through these layers, make note of the items previously viewed at the top of the column and the, uh, and the arrow points to the right. This denotes that the server is now sending information back to the client. So from our in layers, okay, so, and we go back and forth. So if we take a look, okay, here there's no, there's no, the error, okay, we have nothing really going on here because it's going down to the wire. Then we move to the next one, and you can see, we have from here to here, okay? And then we do it again, okay? Now we've gone out and now we're coming back up, okay? So we're coming from, we're at the web client, we're going back into, see that, into the, um, the HTTP client, okay? So you gotta pay attention to what we're looking at here and there, you'll notice that we lost on the fourth tab here, we lost uh, the outbound tab here, but here at number three, we have all three details. And going, say at this point here, we're at the web server, going, okay, and the source is the web client, and, it, uh, and so we're going this direction from in, okay? Destination IP on this guy here, it's going to 254, okay? Layer three, destination was coming that way. Pretty cool. Okay. So if we compare the information displayed on the, in the in layers and that with the out layers column, the in layers and the out layers column, Okay. If we compare those, okay, what are the major differences? Well, the source and destination ports are different. In this, um, in this one here, the source port was 1,025. This one here, the source port is 80. They're switched. Because one's sending, one's receiving, then one's receiving, and one is sending. You just gotta think of the logic in between that one. If we click the inbound outbound PDU details tabs and take a look at those and compare those source destination, they swapped. And then if we go back, now it tells us to go and take a look at the fourth tab, okay, you'll see that just two, one of the OSI model and one of the inbound PDU, because we're no longer because of the receiving device at this point is just the uh, the web server is the last device, and we're at the web client now. 
next part of this lab is we want to display the element of, of the TCP IP protocol suite. So in this part of the activity, you want to use the packet tracer simulation mode to view and examine some of the other protocols that are going on. So we want to close any open PDU windows, okay, in the events list filters, under the visible events section, we want to click show all none. So now that's all been cleared, okay. So depending on whether any communications has occurred prior to starting the original simulation, they should now be, you would now actually see entries for everything. So click that again. And now you can see that I've got ARP, I've got DNS, I've got TCP all rolling through. It is possible that ARP vendors may not show, um, depending on what, on what may have been done prior to the simulation mode, whatever. Uh, extra entries play various roles within the TCP IP suite. Just gives you a fantastic example of everything that's actually going on. Now, if you remember, I said that an ARP was a broadcast that went out to everybody on the network and to say, hey, I know your IP address. I know that you are 192.168.1.254. I know that. What is your MAC address? See that right there? Okay. So that's a broadcast in hexadecimal. But then if we go down to the next piece, next ARP piece, which will be here, we can see that the, the, the receiving node, okay, responded back. It said, hey, okay, and it gave his MAC address, okay, my MAC address and yours, okay, this is my IP address, this is my IP address, this is your IP address, here's the MAC address you're looking for. That was a response to the ARP. That's everything that we just talked about. And if you take a look, this all happens. All this is going on on just that one simple small communication that we had, which was show me your web page. It is so cool. Okay. Currently, there are over 35 possible protocols or event types that are available that we can capture just in this packet tracer. Area. And there's so much more going on, but there's only so much that we could add that Cisco could add for us into this simulator. If we click the first event type or DNS, okay, right here, the DNS said, hey, we have a, we have a request for a website. What's the IP address? Remember, it doesn't, it doesn't read. Okay, he uses numbers. So at the web client, it captured, okay, it said, you know, it captured the address. 192.168.1.254 is the address of the web server. See that right there? 53. That means DNS. So it says, find the first HTTP event in the list and click the colored square box. So the first HTTP event that occurred was all the way down here. Highlight layer four in the OSI model tab. And you'll see it'll send the segment information and the acknowledgement number that we talked about earlier. And it would also be saying that the connection itself was has been established. We have our, our sequence number, our acknowledgement number. TCP manages the connecting and the disconnecting of the communications channel along with other responsibility. This particular event here shows that the communication channel has been established. Last thing I want to do is I want to, I want to click the, uh, the last TCP event, which would be this guy right here. We want to look at layer four in the OSI model tab. 
and you'll see that the device receives the TCP acknowledgement segment on the connection 192.168.1.1 on port 1025. It received the segment information, the sequence number of 104, the acknowledgement number of 273, and the data length of 20. The TCP segment has the expected peer sequence number because it was all incremented up by one. And then if we take one look here, and if we look at our different flags that we've got running here, It's any bigger, there we go. Okay. Now, based on this, this was our finished flag. The tell us this was our last communication and that we were closing a connection. So, the purpose of the event, so if we look at the last TCP event in the OSI model. And we said that it was closed. You have to, you're going to have to learn how to use Wireshark or work with Packet Tracer. Um, what I liked about the Packet Tracer uh, one. It, it actually takes the graphics that we had in the book and then actually built it all for you here so you could all see it out work so much better. We just have a constant communication here of what I'm showing you between all these. Okay. All right. Well, that concludes our lesson for today. Um, hope you got some good information about it. Um, we will uh, this will all be posted onto our our site for you to work with. And uh, you have a nice day and stay healthy.